Well, I greet each one of you this afternoon in the worthy name of Jesus. He is worthy of us being true to him. And he is worthy of our faithful service. And Zach and Ruth Ann, I wish you God's blessing as you take on the calling of the church here today. One of the um, highlights of summer, in my mind, and we haven't gotten there yet, is sweet corn. Eating corn on the cob, or I just enjoy sweet corn. Now, one of the, one of the, the indicators that summer is kind of winding down to the end is when you have that corn day where you process sweet corn. And your wife orders lots of sweet corn, and you spend the day, evening, whatever it is, processing sweet corn. It's, it's a fun time. It's an enjoyable time. But one of the things I've never mastered in processing sweet corn is that holding the corn and with that paring knife just cutting the corn off the cob. It, it just doesn't work for me. Either I'm skimming the top off or I'm just cutting the cob in half. It, it, it doesn't work for me. Then I was introduced to this corn cutting creamer board thing. You know, it's a, a little narrow board and it has a, a knife somehow on it. I don't know how to describe it. And you just hold that thing, you just slide the cob across it and it just cuts it right off. And I can help with that. That I, that I can handle, that I can do. This is, this is great. Well, every, every year at Faith, we have a, a corn project day where we process sweet corn as, as a church to give away to um, ministries, to SNBI and Bradford and different organizations. And one year there, Evelyn King shows up with one of those corn cutting boards mounted to this framework. And you just put your dish pan underneath it. That thing sat there and you just slid those cobs across it as fast as you could, making sure your fingers stay out of the way. And you could cut corn off the cob. This was great. So we have two of these things at our house. And I can help with doing sweet corn other than just husking and, you know, go get this, go get that. The other evening, with Isaac, my fourth son, my second to youngest son, we were practicing baseball, and he was trying to catch the baseball, and it just wasn't working out so well. So I called him over, and I pulled him to my side, and I said, Isaac, I said, when the, when the ball is coming at you over here, you hold the glove out. Well, he, he throws with his left hand, so it's on his other hand. You hold the glove out like this. If it's coming over further, you reach out like this. If it's over here. And I was showing him the different ways to hold the glove because what he was tending to do is either he was just looking at me and grinning big and just holding the glove out randomly, or he was, he was swiping at it or, or just doing different things. And I was trying to show him a, a better way of, of using the glove, how to use the glove to catch. I think for all of us, if it's done right, if it's done well, we enjoy and we appreciate being shown a better way of doing something. We appreciate being shown here's a more efficient way, here's a better way of doing something. And this afternoon, we're going to look at the Apostle Paul as he lays out in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31. He tells the Corinthian church, he says, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. I'm going to show you a better way. And that's what we're going to talk about here this afternoon. That's what we're going to think about here this afternoon. Being shown a better way, particularly as it applies to leaders, but not just to leaders, but to all of us. John C. Maxwell says that leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. Leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less is what he says. So now, before any of you check out and say, well, this message is for Zach and Ruth Ann, for the ordained here, I'd like you to think about the people you have influence over. Maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your children, co-workers, maybe it's people in your community, maybe it's your siblings. You have influence over them. This message is for you. It's for all of us. Because as we look at the more excellent way that Paul lays out for us, I think we'll all see, I'm confident that we'll all see that we have room for growth in this more excellent way. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to read verses 27 to 31. The title of the message this afternoon is simply, A More Excellent Way. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, Paul says, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Verse 29, are all, pro are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, 
Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Verse 31. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And you talk about Paul baiting a hook here. Just just think about this. In in chapter 12 here, Paul was addressing, we're very familiar with the, the body, how God has put the church together to function together as a body. And he was laying that out to the Corinthians. And, and we love looking at that, church, that chapter of how God has put the body together. Everybody has their gift, and God brings that together for the use, the building up, the edification of the church. But Paul was actually working here to correct a problem within the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church had, had, come, to, they had come to idolize the supernatural gift of speaking with tongues. And they were using that gift to say, you're spiritual, you're not. You need to get this. This is something you need to strive towards. You need to go after this, the gift of tongues. And Paul was saying no. He was saying everybody has their gift. Everybody has their gifting, and your giftings are to work together for the edification of the church, for the unity, for the building up of the church. Because of their their focus on the supernatural gift of speaking in tongues, there is diversity and there is discord and there is contention in the church. Paul is saying it's not the way it is. God has put it together as a body working together, each one being important. Then he comes to verse 31 and he says, But let me show you a more excellent way. Now just imagine this letter being read in the Corinthian church and reads this and just, just lays it out, just kind of gets their minds all wrapped around how the body is to function together And then he says, but let me show you a more excellent way. Then he goes into the chapter 13, the love chapter. And that's what we want to focus on. Love is the more excellent way. Love is the more excellent way that Paul lays out to us throughout chapter 13 that we want to study and we want to think about here this afternoon. I believe that no matter where we find ourselves in life, love is something that we all have room I have room, we all have room to grow and improve in. As we observe the, the world around us, the condition of society of today, I think it's safe to say that if you boil it all down, love is the one thing that is needed most. Love is needed in our world today. And as Christians, we have the opportunity to model and to demonstrate love in a time like never before. We have the opportunity to show people what love look like, looks like in our churches, in our families, in our workplaces, in our relationships. We get to model love, the more excellent way of love that Paul lays out here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Follow along as we read verses 1 to 3 of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Notice what Paul says about the absence of love. Verse 1, he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, have not love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be, to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Nothing. Paul says you can be the most excellent speaker. You can be a speaker that you can't tell if it's a man or an angel talking. Missing love, just noise. It's nothing. You can have the gift of prophecy. You can understand all mysteries, have all wisdom, have all knowledge. But if you're a void of love, it's worthless. It's nothing. You can give all your goods. Get this. You can give all your goods to bestow, to, to feed the poor. Give your body to be burned. You're absent of love, missing love, it's nothing. Those are strong words. Those are strong words that Paul is laying out, and he is telling the Corinthian church that you can go through all the right motions, you can do all the right things, and you can do it excellently to the best ability, but if you don't have love, it is nothing. I think what Paul is really driving at is he's trying to get us to grab a hold of the fact that love is our motivation. Love is what motivates us to do what we're called to do. Love is what motivates us to to reach out and to be involved and to to fulfill our position 
in the church. Love is that motivating factor. That's why we do it. It's because of love. We could spend all afternoon on thinking about the, the whole aspect of love. I think there, there's kind of three components of love that motivates us. It's Christ's love for us. It's our love for Christ. And then our love for people, our love for others, is that motivating love, motivation of love to do what we are called to do. Without that, it's nothing. We're just going through the motions. We're doing the right things, but we're not doing it for the right reason of love. The more excellent way is love. Then Paul goes on in verses 4 through 8. This is where we're going to spend the most of the time here this afternoon. Verses 4 through 8 of laying out what does love look like? Love fleshed out. What does it look like? We're going to break verses 4 through 8 apart into four, I'm sorry, into three different sections here. First section is love is, then love does not, and then love does. And we're going to pull these out of these four, uh, these four verses here, verses 4 through 8. Follow along as we read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. Charity or love suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Verse 4, love is patient and kind. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Love is patient. The idea of suffering long is that love endures. It doesn't give up. Love doesn't give up. It doesn't, it, it puts up. It doesn't quit when life gets tough. It doesn't quit when it's working with the struggles, the imperfections, the difficulties that sometimes come our way. Love is patient. Frankly, love puts up with, love, put, love and patience is what we need as we live in a world working with fallen people in a fallen world. Love is patient. It doesn't quit. It endures it continues on. I believe that patience is something that is very needed in our world today. Because frankly, the life is full of frustrations. It's full of hurts. It's full of unmet expectations, injustices. All kinds of things come our way. And to, to, work, with those, to work with those things that happen in life, we need an abundance of patience. Love is patient. Far too often, I'm a schedule-oriented, I'm, I'm schedule-oriented, and I'm driven. I have this block of time to accomplish this. I then have this block of time to accomplish this, and that's how my day is mapped out. And when this block of time grows into this block of time, and this block of time gets shrunk into this, blood pressure goes up, I get frustrated. I need to grow in patience. I need to grow in love and modeling that as patience. Patience doesn't get frustrated in that. Patience is love fleshed out. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, he says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. He says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering, with patience and doctrine. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with patience. Love is patient. We are called to lead, we are called to love with patience. Patience is the, the passive side where it endures, it waits, it's gracious, it's not reacting, pushing out. But love is also kind. That's the, that's the, that's the active side of love. Patience and kindness are the two sides of the same coin of love where they're brought together. Kindness is the reaching out. Kindness has that disposition of being good-natured, being tender, being affectionate. Love is kind. Kindness is a readiness to do good, to help, to relieve the burden of others, to be useful, to serve, to be tender, to be sympathetic to others. When I think of kindness, being, I think of patience and kindness together, that love, I think of Jesus as the perfect model. 
Jesus as the perfect model as he walked among men. The, the Gospels are full of stories where Jesus modeled patience and kindness as he dealt with the interruptions of a person needing healing, of holding the children, of eating with and talking with those that were the outcast and the downcast in society. Jesus modeled patience and kindness, love for us to follow after today. And compared with that example of Jesus, I fall way short. I have lots of room for growth in that. As I was studying for this and preparing for this, as a childhood memory came back to me as a, as a young boy, as before we moved to Grenada, my father had a side business of working on snowmobiles, and one afternoon I was helping him in the, as he was working on a snowmobile. I don't remember exactly what we were doing, but he had the snowmobile up on a, on a dolly uh, type thing where, where you could you put it in at the back and you lift up the snowball, you could wheel it around, it would lift the, the, the track off the back and it would be, it, the track was free. And so my job that afternoon was that, that as we were working on that snowmobile, as I was supposed to be helping him, was I was to sit on the snowmobile and I was to hold the throttle at a certain RPM and he was checking something on the engine. I, I have no idea what, was, what he was doing, but he was checking something. I was to hold the throttle at a certain RPM and while we were doing that, for whatever reason, the track on the snowmobile, it was, it was free, it was spinning freely, it flew apart. It, it disintegrated, I have no idea, maybe dad knows to this day why that happened. But when that happened, several things happened at the same time. The, the dolly that was holding the sled up, it, it flew out and there was a handle that came back and, and hit me on the back. The, the pieces of the track flew into the garage door and just destroyed the garage door and the, the snowmobile fell back down, the hood slammed shut and it was just chaos instantly. And I, I, was, I was a young, young boy. I don't remember how old it was, maybe seven or eight or nine. I'm not sure. This just terrified me. And I was in tears. And, and I remember my dad, of all those other things that took place, the damage and everything that happened, he was at my side. And he was like, what, what, where does it hurt? I was like, my back hurts. And he checked my back out. Well, does it hurt here? And he was very patiently and kindly checking on me and totally ignoring everything else. And I thought about that because I, I felt love in that moment. He didn't say, I love you. He didn't say, son, I love you so much. But by his actions, by him patiently and kindly being there with me, I felt love because patience and kindness is love being fleshed out. I also think another time where I was sitting with a, another church leader and, and we, were, we were working through a, a difficult situation and, and the emotions were high, and it was, it was difficult, it was stressful, and there's just a lot of things going on. It's very challenging. And I, as I, I observed, as, as his other leader led out in this, his patience and his kindness. And again, love was felt. Again, he didn't say, I love you. He didn't tell everybody in the room, I love you all. But as he led out as a leader with that patience and kindness, you could feel the love. You could feel love. That's love is. Love is patient and love is kind. Then Paul goes on to say that love does not. The next part that we'll look at is, is things that love does or love is not. Continue on there in verse 4. The first, first one is that love does not envy. Envy is totally incompatible with love. Envy destroys love. Envy separates relationships. Envy pulls things apart. Love brings it together. Love does not envy. Love does not envy. They're totally incompatible. And I, I wonder if Paul has this at the top of the list of things that love does not do because of what he was addressing in the Corinthian church, of how they were desiring the, the gift of tongues and how they were using that to leverage and to bring discord in the church. And Paul says, no, that's not love. The more excellent way of love does not envy. Love does not envy. Envy is destructive and tears things apart. Think of King David, and I'm sorry, King Saul, and David, King Saul allowed envy to destroy him. He allowed envy to grip him to where and to consume him to where he was hunting David to kill him. Envy destroys. Envy separate, separates. Love does not. Love does not envy. Paul goes on. He says that love does not boast. It, it vaunteth not itself. It doesn't call attention to itself. Love does not desire and crave the praise of others. Love doesn't call attention to ourselves because when we're, when we're boasting, when we're calling attention to ourselves, we're pulling the attention away from God. 
We're pulling the praise away from God and the honor of Christ where it deserves to be. Love doesn't build itself up. Love doesn't envy. Love doesn't pull upon others to build its ego. Love does not boast. It vaunteth not itself. Then Paul ties right in close to that. He says, love is not puffed up. It envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. Is not proud. Another translation puts it that love is not arrogant. It is not arrogant. Love is not enamored with the, the feelings of what are others thinking of me. I think we've all come across somebody in our, in our life already where they were puffed up. They were full of themselves. They were arrogant. They were hard to get along with. That's not love. That's not love. I call us as, as leaders, we need to check our ego at the door. Leaders are humble and modest. Humility, someone said, is not that we think less of ourselves, but that we think of ourselves less. We don't think of ourselves as much. We think of others. Amy Carmichael once said that those who think too much of themselves don't think enough. Those who think too much of themselves don't think enough. We don't want to be like the Pharisee in Luke 18, 11, who had an overinflated ego. He said, God, I thank thee that I am not like these other men, that I am not like as other men. Love is arrogant. Love is not arrogant, I'm sorry. Love is not puffed up. Verse 5, it says, love does not behave itself unseemly. Rude. Love is not rude. Behaving itself, oneself unseemly is conduct that is improper, it's disgraceful, and it brings dishonor to the name of Christ. That is not love. Love does not act that way. Now, I'm sure that none of us would put ourselves in the category that, that we're rude. We wouldn't call ourselves a rude person. But I think we would agree that society is, is lowering the bar. And they have adopted, society has adopted more and more coarse and thoughtless standards of just basic common courtesy, common decency of how to, how to act in public. I mean, just, just to observe traffic at a merge point when you're in, coming into a construction zone. And just observe the rudeness that takes place as you come from two lanes down to one. And the, the concern I have is that while we wouldn't consider ourselves rude, as society lowers that bar, are we lowering our bar just a couple degrees ahead of society? Better than society, but yet we're also lowering the bar. Love is not rude. That's not love. Love is not selfish or seeketh her own. Verse 5, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own. Love does not insist on its own way. Love is the opposite of Burger King's slogan. Burger King's slogan is have it your way or have it my way. That's not love. Love is the opposite of that. It doesn't take that and twist it where we're driven. We have to have our own way. We take care of ourselves. We take care of our health. But it, we do not insist on having our way. Love is not selfish. It does not seek our own. Jesus, the greatest leader of all time, didn't come to please himself. He didn't come to be served, but he came to serve others. Luke 22, verses 24 through 27, Luke writes about, Jesus said this, and there was strife among them, which was his disciples, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, Jesus said unto them, the king of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors, but ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. He that is chief, as he that doth serve. For which is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth? Is not he that sitteth at meat? But Jesus says, but I am among you as he that serveth. Love is not selfish. Does not seek its own. Jesus was the greatest. The greatest leader. The greatest example. And he said, I'm among you as one that serveth. That's how we're called to lead. We're called to lead with love that seeketh not its own. Continuing on there, Paul says, Charity vaunteth not itself. I'm sorry. Is not easily provoked. I had the wrong verse there. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Loved is not irritable. Love is not easily riled up. It does not easily get angry. If we're not rude, if we're not puffed up, we're not arrogant. Love does not easily get provoked. 
is not easily riled up. Sometimes as leaders, we're called upon to work through different or sometimes very difficult situations. And it seems that there's plenty of opportunity to get upset about something. Some sort of injustice that happens, some sort of problem that's going on, something that's happening, and it seems there's plenty of opportunity to get upset or to become angry or to become bitter. But that's not the way of love. Love is not easily riled up. Love does not allow its emotions to come out in a destructive way that is harmful to others. Love does not think evil. Thinketh no evil, the end of verse 5 there. Love does not think evil, or it is not resentful. Another translation says that love does not keep score of the wrongs of others, what others have done, the wrongs that others have done. Love is quick to forgive. Love is quick to forgive. And lastly, Paul says in verse 6, it says that love, as far as love does not, love does not rejoice in iniquity. In the more excellent way of love, there is no distorted pleasure of injustices or iniquity or wrongs. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. And as I read that, I, I, my mind went back to September 11th of 2001 and the, and the aftermath of that as there was videos and there was pictures of people rejoicing and dancing of the death and the destruction. That's not love. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. That's not the more excellent way of love. Rather, the more excellent way of love is that it rejoices in truth. Love rejoices in truth. And in this context here, what Paul is saying is that love rejoices in the righteous behavior. Love rejoices in behavior and principles that align with God's word, align with the gospel and God's word. In other words, love rejoices in someone who is growing in Christ, in someone who is living in integrity, in someone who is exemplifying righteous conduct, in someone who is exemplifying holy character, love rejoices in that. Love delights in that. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not puffed up or proud. It does not behave itself unseemly or rudely. It seeketh not her own. It is not easily provoked or angry nor resentful does not rejoice in iniquity or wrongdoing. Then Paul says in verse 7, he gives four actions that love does. Four actions that love does. And the part that makes it so challenging in verse 7 is that three-letter word that's in there four times. All. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. I don't know, it seems like Paul has a thing with superlatives here. All. Bears all things. And the idea here of, the, of the, the Greek word that is used here with bears all things, it means to put a roof over it. To cover with silence. In other words, love is willing to work in confidentiality. Love is willing to work quietly. Love is willing to put a roof over it. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, Above all things, have fervent charity among, among yourselves, for charity or love shall cover a multitude of sins. Love doesn't air out somebody else's dirty laundry. Love doesn't share the struggles and the difficulty that somebody else is working, what somebody else is going through just to, just to put the information out there. Love works in confidentiality, in guardedness. This bears close ties with what Paul says earlier about love being patient, but it brings with it the overtones of confidence, confidentiality, that when you talk to somebody, that's where it stays. It might involve those that need to know, but that's where it stays. Love puts a roof over it, keeps it sealed, bears all things. I love the next one. Love believes all things, believeth all things. Love looks for the good in others. Love looks for the good in others and draws it out. Love loves to highlight the good that it sees in others, believes all things. This doesn't mean that, that love is gullible and that, it, that it's just putting out there just wishful thinking, but it calls out the good in others. It believes all things. It doesn't go through life with a suspicious bent of everybody's out to get me. Everybody's trying to, to get me. That person didn't show up, so... Do they not like me? That's not love. Love 
believes all things. It's not cynical. It's not looking. It's not trying to figure out how did this or that person do this or that to try to harm me. When something doesn't quite make sense, love assumes the best rather than the worst, believes all things. And the next one takes it even further. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. And the idea that Paul has here is that when there isn't much good to believe in, when it just seems like the case is hopeless, love still hopes. Even though there isn't much good there, Paul says, to call out love hopes for the better day when there will be good. In other words, love never writes somebody off. Love never writes anybody off, but it hopes for the better day. It works towards that restoration. It works towards where there is something good to believe in. There is something good to highlight. Love hopes all things. It doesn't give up. And lastly, Paul wraps it up again, back where he started. Endureth all things. Back to patience. Love endureth all things. Love is patient. It's long-suffering. It's enduring. That's the more excellent way of love that Paul, that Paul lays out here in First Corinthians, first part of First Corinthians, chapter thirteen. And in my opinion, as I as I studied this, and as I as I wrestled with this, Paul didn't spare anything. If you if you look at this and as you study this, I know there's room for growth in my life. There is areas in this that, that Paul lays out that I need to work on, that I need to grow in. Love is the foundational and the motivational factor. That is critical for all of us. No matter what calling of life we find ourselves in, no matter what role we're filling, be it in the church, the home, in work, in the community, love is something that we can grow in. Love is something that all of us can grow in, in the more excellent way of love. We want to end here on verse 8 of chapter 13. Paul says, Charity never faileth. Love never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Love never faileth. Love is timeless. Love always wins out. Prophecies, tongues, knowledge, they all have their limit, Paul says. They all have their end. They all can only go so far. But love is timeless. Love never faileth. Zach and Ruth Ann, is, you're called to lead here, the church in Myerstown. I exhort you to lead with love, as Paul has laid out here in 1 Corinthians 13. And never forget that Jesus is that perfect example and that source of love. God bless you.